Would you please make welcome probably the man who single-handedly changed in the last 30 years, the face of puppetry in Australia, director, designer, writer, Nigel Trifford. Thank you. The microphone's on the way, I'm fucking screaming. Okay. <laughs> I earned my first paycheck when I was 12. One pound, 12 and sixpence, yes, for playing the young boy whose voice had not yet broken <laughs> on ABC Radio School's broadcast at Hobart. I played that part for a couple of years until puberty put a stop to it. it makes me realise that I've got a 40 year span of what passes for career. That's 40 years of stumbling around stages, raging at the dark. I sound like Captain Ahab. I've been many things. Child actor, talented young thing who should be supported despite his complete lack of discipline. <laughs> boy wonder, hippie expatriate, the bad boy of Australian theatre, the wunderkind, enfant terrible. I don't know what came next. Complete pain in the arse, by the way. I shot my mouth off from the minute I started doing serious press in 71 and barely stopped for breath until the mid 90s. Every adolescent lurch of my psyche was chronicled. Motormouth, John Truscott called me, and he was right. But you can't be a 40 year old enfant terrible. I passed that crown to Barry Cosby with great relief a long time ago. I know he did a very good job of it during his time on the roundabout. I wonder who holds the poison chalice now. I hope someone's grasped it. It's quite fun for a while, but you do make a lot of enemies. Not everybody forgets. I'm not a bad long-term hater myself. The only problem with... <laughs> Leading a life on the edge. The only problem with that is that you will inevitably fall off. <laughs> Suddenly, I was the oldest one in the rehearsal room, and the stakes had changed. I'd left the art house circuit behind and gone commercial. That I did. It was all TV stars and big theatres. I was the director, register. He who must be obeyed, Cecil B. de Triffitt. <laughs> Heady territory and scary, scary stuff. At this moment, rather, I don't have the need to be controversial anymore. I'm over that. I'm not that person anymore. I wish I was. Funnily enough, when Pete mentioned controversy, I just laughed and said, how can I possibly be controversial about a moribund art form? <laughs> drip fed and kept alive by public subsidy. <laughs> that not one member of the adult general public gives a rat's ass. <laughs> so I'm sorry to disappoint you on that. It's controversial. <laughs> At this point in my life, I guess I've got a few options available for me. I can go the bitter and narky, tragic, seen it all before route. Perhaps become a total public embarrassment. That's always quite fun. <laughs> I could do the audition for boring old fart. Or perhaps take another road. I rather prefer the uh, avuncular eminence breeze. <laughs> the benign tribal elder. <laughs> so it's in this latter newly adopted role <laughs> that I'll talk to you this morning. I used to talk about theatre of the impossible. Good line then. Good line now. But in the light of all the myriad impossibilities we see every day on the TV and in the cinema courtesy computer animation, now I'm not so sure. Perhaps we need to be tackling a different set of impossibilities. The only topic I'm truly expert at is myself. I've always found myself a source of endless fascination. <laughs> Masturbation is not just a genital fixation. So forgive me if I dredge down into my own detail for a moment to make a point or two. I'm all I know. I was wondering just how I got here. What combination of elements, accidents, destinies led me to this point in time, right here, right now. Mr. Jolly Squibble was a childhood fixture. Um, once TV came to Tasmania, we got it later than the mainland, 
I still don't know how he drew those pictures. The giant pencil nose I certainly blame for every deviant sexual act. I've ever <laughs> and that's saying something. The Black Theatre of Prague was a clue. I saw them in 1966 in Hobart, in a world where Black Light was a sideshow novelty, not a dance floor staple. I don't think I'd seen it before. My first glimpse of the impossible. Things flew, changed shape, merged, disappeared. And it was a European impossible at that. A whole other sensibility. It was a double hit. In London, I saw the Bread and Puppet Theatre hid under the long Chinese dragon on a sunny spring afternoon in Sloan Square in 1969. The height of the hippie era in London. And we wove our way through the streets and then into the backstage door of the Royal Court Theatre and onto the stage. And from there into the stalls to see, for free, puppetry transformed into politics. The original street theatre, as we know it, the pure roots of the bowdlerized trash that passes for community celebration these days. If I see one more person with a white bird on a pole <laughs> with a candle up its bum, I'm going to throw up. <laughs> the Living Theatre was there too. Enjoy that? <laughs> Anarchy and the unexpected. I just wanted to run off and join the countercultural circus. And Maybe I did. And still in London. First room on the right, after the stairs in the National Gallery, Trafalgar Square, there were the Impressionists. The first moment in art history where the real became the instant, where the world was captured as shimmering, lucent light. Another glimpse of the impossible. And the Impressionists led me to the Futurists, those nihilist loons in Moscow and Milan, Marinetti, Tristan Zara, and the idea that anything was up for grabs, not just the visual arts, but all of them, that art could and should be a melting pot of all the arts, scrambled, disemboweled, turned on their heads, reduced to their pure essence, including the theatre. They had the idea of the Sintesi, for example, that is literally a syn synthesis, a short play. The plays are often only 90 seconds long. Sometimes I, I staged a whole heap of them with uh, Yellow Brick Road shows in the mid 70s with Andrew Hansen, whom I see over there. Um, those darn futurists even did it away with actors, uh, something I've considered on many occasions. One of the Sintesi featured a blue triangle and a square in conversation in 1915. Now consider this for a moment, because within this little bit of theatrical anarchy, there's a very big idea indeed. The futurists led me on to Dada, the surrealists. All things were plastic, elastic, had a life of their own. The object was personalised, transformed, transforming. Seeking an inner language, a new way to express secret thoughts. The political, the anarchic, the secret world was colliding in my head, creating new impossibilities, constructing an individual reality. Or more to the point, a choice of realities. I think vast quantities of marijuana and the emergent counterculture may have had just a tad to do with it too. Above all, I was being introduced to forms of theatre and styles of art with a healthy cynicism, an uncaring deconstruction of what was there before, an anger and a politics, a muscularity, and dare I say it, a masculinity. <laughs> it wasn't limp, it wasn't effete, it wasn't precious. It was odd, bent as buggery, but it was proactive theatre that made you want to go back for more. Brains were scrambled, ideas were challenged, realities questioned. And if you're thinking at this moment while I ramble on, just what has this got to do with me? I think again, it's got everything to do with me. Mama's Little Horror Show was the first Australian show, I think, to take puppetry, or rather my expanded concept of puppetry, to a larger adult general public commercial audience. 
things and more or less succeed. John Pinder, my dear, dear friend, picked that show up and in a stunning act of good faith put it in the last laugh, playing for months to an audience of over-emotional drunks. It was a big hit and I was launched as Enfant Terrible because in throwing out the script and soundtrack and any pretense at sticking to the themes presented me, I unwittingly placed myself and the rest of us in the rehearsal room into a state of theatrical grace. The space to genuinely go where no man had gone before. I knew nothing of puppetry at all. And as it unfolded to me, so I carried the revelation over to the audience. The great thing about being thrown in the deep end with a new discipline is that you never know any of the rules until you unwittingly break them. In the breaking lies the sweet accident of creation. I had a tendency in my megalomania to devise, design and direct. I love the hidden art of structuring a show. I choose to think I'm quite good at it. This gives me a kind of God perspective. I often have the image of a, of a giant hand moving the scenery when I watch my shows. The, the designs that I've known since they were little baby models in a giant theatre, it's my hand. Uh, what if what we refer to as the set is a puppet? What if every scene changes seen through those eyes? I was led to the notion of slowly building the image, then deconstructing it, probably because I couldn't work out how to get it on and off in time, but mostly because as a designer, this is what I see as I make it then an image form, bit by bit. Start with nothing, an empty stage, and build it, reveal the picture, piece by piece, then if you're lucky, knock it down again. I've done a whole lot of shows using that theory, but I digress. Now comes the hard part. <sighs> Grown-up stuff happens to us all eventually. It's just a matter of time for most of us before we're catapulted into death and destruction of some form or another. Marriages collapse, kids are born, parents die, we fail, we succeed, we fail, we move from one state into another and glimpse the continuity of life. For me this process began in 1980 when my dad died and reached one of its many zeniths in 1982 where at age 32 I discovered I was adopted and coincidentally entered the handspan rehearsal room to create secrets. Now I dredge up this unfortunate personal stuff to make a point. When one is in extremis, when one is hit by the psychic truck, when one is wrenched and reduced, one is in a state of tortured grace. It's an empty landscape, a black stage. There are no normal methods of communication to explain it. There's no way to express it. One searches, unwittingly perhaps, for a higher language, a lateral, different language. A language of signs and symbols of tiny detail, a broad swoop of image, to try and encapsulate the moment, to speak when words are no use. It's the principle behind opera, poetry, jazz, ballet. My th first thought, literally, once I poured my tearful mother into a taxi after she told me, and had a moment to examine my inner landscape was that I had been here before. I knew this place. I'd staged it. Mum was a little horror show. I'd intuitively tapped into that space. The language, the secret language. All live puppetry happens in that same space. It all involves a conjoined journey, performance and public together into a magic space where disbelief is suspended from the outset. An empty space in which anything might happen. Because in the very nature of puppetry, anything can. I'm attempting to recarve the path through the jungle I thought I'd cleared all these years ago. I have a garden now. I know that nothing is stable. Everything grows overgrows, needs pruning, changes, dies, emerges again from the soil. It's in us. But there are weeds. I'm trying to plant a tree here. The next person will eventually walk the lonely road. 
I want them to be sitting here watching me. I hope they are. And soon there's that show. And please, God, please, try not to go on and on about funding. Nobody owes you a living. If you ain't coming up with the goods, don't expect to be subsidised for doing it. They've only got you on the drip feed because they need you for the zoo. <laughs> One of everything. <laughs> It's not a time for altruism and limp, well-meaning banalities anymore. It's time for a business plan. So make one. I'm not going to tell you what to say, what to do. It's obvious if you could, but see, big picture. Let us all be parents of the industry for the next few days. How do we nurture it? How do we bring people into it? How do we train them? Where do, we go? Where do they go once trained? What options are open artistically for them? Where is our focus? Where's the national company? I could go on. Change our collective destiny. Go on, do it. I'm just about done my day. Events somewhat beyond my control seem to have spirited me away and dropped me on a tropical sun deck in far north Queensland. So, now it's your turn. And let me turn the key and open the door to your empty stage. Like all empty stages, it'll have the ghosts of all those who've played there before. Embrace the ghosts. Feed off their energy. Learn from their mistakes. And take their blessing. Then turn away. Make your own show. Have fun. Surprise me.